in-person attendees may approach the table where the may when the mayor asks where there is any public input on an item that they would like to speak to. Um, remote attendees can log in to go to meeting using the login links, phone numbers, and access code that appear on the broadcast and live stream and posted on the front page of the meeting agenda. This option includes audio input and written chat input. If you are participating via computer, indicate which item you would like to speak to in the chat function and note that you would like to speak during the appropriate section. If you are participating via phone, indicate which item you would like to speak to during the appropriate section. All comments, whether in person, audio, or written, must be accompanied by a name and address. Additionally, written public input is accepted by contacting the City Council directly from the city, City's webpage at www.cityofdubuque.org slash council contacts and through the City Clerk's Office email at ctyclerk at cityofdubuque.org. This information will be reiterated during the meeting. Attendance for this session is as follows. Mayor Cavanaugh. Here. Council members Farber. Here. Jones. Here. Resnick. Here. Roussel. Here. Sprank. Here. Weppel. Here. City Manager Van Milligan. Here. City Attorney Bromwell. Here. Mayor Cavanaugh, I'll turn it over to you for the Pledge of Allegiance. All right. I invite all who are able to please rise and join us for the Pledge of Allegiance. Allegiance to the flag of the United States of America and to the Republic for which it stands, one nation under God, indivisible, with liberty and justice for all. On our agenda tonight, we have one proclamation for veterans of war, uh, war post 508 recognition. Okay, so I do know that Bob Felderman was going to accept this proclamation. Is anybody here to accept this proclamation this evening? Not seeing anyone? Okay, all right, so I will accept this proclamation on the Post's behalf and uh, for the veterans of foreign wars. So I'm just, I'll go ahead and read the proclamation. City of Dubuque Proclamation. Thank you. <laughs> Whereas the veterans of foreign wars of the United States believe America is defined by how it treats those who sacrifice to protect, to protect it. And whereas the VFW believes in protecting and fighting for those brave enough to fight for us, the residents of the United States, and whereas the VFW fights and defends the rights of America's veterans for the benefits they deserve, for available education scholarships, and for living assistance for them and their families. And whereas the Dubuque Veterans of Foreign Wars Leo A. Schwind, post 508, mustered on October 2nd, 1920, as I was first and oldest existing VFW post. And whereas the Dubuque Veterans of Foreign Wars, Gerald F. Winter, post 9663, mustered on July 23, 1952. And whereas the Dubuque Leo A. Schwinn, post 508, was recognized by the Commander-in-Chief and Adjutant General of the VFW of the United States for 100 years of exceptional service to the community, our nation, and America's veterans on October 2, 2020. And whereas VFW post 9663 consolidated into VFW post 508, on January 16th, 2024. Now, therefore, I, Brad M. Cavanaugh, Mayor of the City of Dubuque, Iowa, on behalf of the City Council staff and residents of Dubuque, do hereby proclaim that the veterans of foreign wars, Leo A. Schwind, Gerald F. Winter Post 508, continues as the first VFW post in Iowa, in the City of Dubuque, Iowa, and call upon the people of Dubuque in the Dubuque area to recognize the members for their service to veterans and their families in our community. Right. So, Mayor, I'll just uh, let you know that while the exit lights and everything will continue to work, uh, within 30 minutes, our temporary lighting is going to be done. So it's battery operated. Every, everybody got your phones charged? <laughs> We're going to need them. My laptop All right, thank you, Mike. All right, you can move us along, Trish. I don't have service. You don't have service. Anyone participating in the meeting in person who would like to discuss one of the consent items Please approach the table where the mayor, when the mayor asks if there is any in-person input, and state your name and address. For all remote attendees, please enter your name and address in the chat function, and state or state your name and address over the phone when the mayor asks if there is any virtual input. If more than one participant would like to speak, then city staff will determine the speaking order of the participants. 
please state the item you would like to move from the consent agenda for separate discussion and consideration. Consent items can be found on page two through four of the agenda. All right, thank you, Trish. So we are going to move pretty quickly, but I want to make sure we move in a way that allows people to participate if need be. So do we have anyone who would like to pull any of the consent items from the agenda for separate discussion this evening? Anyone from the public? Seeing no one. There's no one um, logged in, we see, to the go-to meeting. So anyone from the table? Mr. Mayor. Mr. Resnick. I move to receive and file the documents, adopt the resolutions, and deal with the consent items as recommended. Second. Got a motion by Resnick, second by Roussel. Trish, would you call the roll, please? Weppel? Aye. Roussel? Aye. Jones? Aye. Resnick? Aye. Barber? Aye. Frank? Aye. And Kevin. Aye. <laughs> yes. <laughs> motion passes 7-0. That's okay. Next on the agenda are items to be set for public hearing. We have one item to be set for public hearing. It's Old Mill Road Lift Station and Fourth Main Project Phase 1. Initiate public bidding process and setting the date for the public hearing for August 19, 2024. Mr. Mayor. Mr. Self. I move to receive and file and set the public hearing for August 19th. Second by Farber. And by Russell, second by Farber. Trish, would you call the roll, please? Wessel? Aye. Russell? Aye. Jones? Aye. Resnick? Aye. Farber? Aye. Spring? Aye. Kavanaugh? Aye. The motion passes 7 0. <laughs> Next are the public hearings. We have three public hearings tonight. At this time, anyone participating in the meeting in person who would like to discuss one of the public hearing items, please plan to approach the table. When the mayor asks if there's any any in-person input for the public hearing that he would like to speak to, for <laughs> all remote attendees, please enter your name and address in the chat function and state your question, question or state your name and address over the phone. So when the mayor asks if there's any virtual input for the public hearing you would like to speak to, if more than one participant would like to speak, then city staff will determine the speaking order of the participants. Mr. Mayor. Mr. Jones. I move to receive and file the communications and further move that the requirement that the proposed ordinance be considered and voted on for passage of two council meetings, part of the meeting of which is to be finally passed, be suspended. Second by Wethel. Motion by Jones and a second by Wethel. Wally, please. Yes, good evening, Mayor and City Council members. Uh, Wally Wernmach, Planning Services Director. So the public hearing tonight is to amend the Unified Development Code to include a definition of off-premise parking lot <coughs> and to list the off-premise parking lot as an accessory use in a C2 neighborhood shopping center district and a C3 general uh, commercial zoning district. Um, so we had Straka Johnson, Marty Johnson is working with Fidelity Bank on mining court. Mining, um, Fidelity Bank purchased a lot across the street from their existing facility. They have two bank buildings located there. Um, they're looking at making that parking lot into a, a, a off street parking lot for their employees. They have a training center um, that they'll use um, for that. When they came in with the site plan, our current code would not allow an off premise parking lot in a C2 or a C3 district. Um, they are allowed in a C4 and a C5 district with permission of the city council. However, um, in order to accommodate the off street parking, um, we worked with Strock and Johnson to submit a text amendment in order to allow that to do so. Um, if the parking lot was directly adjacent to their property on a separate lot, that would be fine, but this is actually separated by binding court itself. Um, so staff worked with the applicant. We did notify everyone within 200 feet of, or we did notify people in the newspaper, I guess, for a text amendment. Um, the big thing about this is we came up with a definition, and that definition for a parking lot off-premise states that it's a hard surface area not located in a public rights-of-way is designated for the parking of vehicles and which meets all of the following standards. A, the off-premise parking lot shall be incidental and subordinate to a permitted use and located on a lot within 300 feet of the principal use it serves. The off-premise parking lot shall be owned and maintained by the property owner of the principal use it serves. No vehicle or outside storage of any kind shall be permitted in or on the off-premise parking lot. And a site plan shall be reviewed and approved prior to the installation of an off-premise parking lot. The reason why this is uh, regulated the way it is, is we didn't want people just coming in and purchasing lots and putting off street parking lots in for private use. That's like allowed in the downtown di uh, district. So this is a very specific written for um, the Fidelity Bank operation, but it, it does come up very extremely rare um, for that. But in order for them to operate, we looked at the text amendment. 
But you will see discussion from the Zoning Advisory Commission uh, with regards to having the property owner maintain the property and what if there's an opportunity for lease opportunities for that. This is a very specific amendment that was being pro provided by Fidelity Bank and Straka Johnson. We are in the process of updating the Unified Development Code. We're almost ready to sign the contract. So as we move forward, those types of discussions will occur. But the concern from staff was we just didn't want people buying vacant lots, putting parking lots out, and then generating and come off that where it could be a developable lot for another commercial business. It had to be accessory. So that's why it's listed as accessory use to the business that it serves. Um, so by a vote of four to zero, the Zoning Advisory Commission recommends approval of the text amendment and a simple majority vote is all it's needed to approve the amendment. Thank you, Wally. We're on a public hearing to consider a request from Marty Johnson, uh, Straka Johnson Architects, to amend the Unified Development Code to include a definition of off-premise parking lot and list off-premise parking lot as an accessory use in the C2 Neighborhood Shopping Center and C3 commercial, General Commercial Zoning Districts. And the Zoning Advisory Commission is recommending approval. Do we have any public input on this item? I'm seeing and hearing no one. Okay, still don't see anybody else on the go-to meeting. So that means you can bring it back to the table for any discussion. Mr. Mayor. Yeah, that's right. Thank you. So do we also need to uh, define storage? Because you mentioned that, mm -hmm. uh, and maybe we've already done that, but people like to push it sometimes, and, mm -hmm. we, and we're waiting months and months to act on it. Could you? Yeah, so uh, Charlie Miller is our zoning enforcement officer. We actually do define storage. Um, and storage could be defined in different ways if it's on street or on street or off street. So when it's on private property, the Planning Services Department regulates that. That's any vehicle that's parked for longer than 48 hours and has to be in a paved stored area, meet setback requirements. We do understand from time to time people go on vacation and there's a vehicle that's parked there for longer than 48 hours. These are really to control those situations where people are leaving vehicles for like weeks at a time, um, junk vehicles and certain other situations for that. There is on street storage where if it's parked on a street for longer than 24 hours, the police department gets involved with it. And then we have the right away area where it's kind of a little bit in between um, the parkway where the engineering department, the planning department gets involved with that. So we do have definitions of uh, vehicle storage, which will be longer than 48 hours. And that's something that we enforce upon. Now the time for that, what happens for us is we, when we have complaints, we do send out notices. We have to give them um, a certain period of time to correct the violation. Um, and Charlie works with them to, in order to basically, first of all, educate the resident, because a lot of times they may not be aware of the rule. We're not here to fine and cite right away. We're here to educate. Um, so sometimes that takes some time, um, and then we give them a second notice opportunity, and then we go to municipal infraction for that. So Great. Thank you for uh, your information. Thank you, Mr. Mayor. Mm -hmm. Any other questions or discussion? Well, we did hear you say that we're going to, as we update the Unified Development Code, this will be a part of that discussion. So, so it's not just an amendment. This would be something that would be, this discussion is going to work into that right. discussion. Yeah, exactly. You know, just recently we waived all the uh, removed requirements for off-street parking in a cathedral in Jack's Park Historic District. Right. We have the Walker Parking Study for the downtown. You'll hear, you just heard it with the Chaplain Schmidt Island. So parking is a huge discussion. It's actually a big reform in the zoning community about actually eliminating uh, required off-street parking spaces. It doesn't necessarily mean that you can't provide them in certain areas, but it just means that, you know, a lot of times we're having surface areas are being covered up by parking. So yes, this will be something that will be discussed. Gotcha. Thank you. Anybody else? Okay. Motion here is to receive and file and waive the three readings. Trish, would you call the roll, please? Weapon? Aye. Roussel? Aye. Jones? Aye. Resnick? Aye. Barber? Aye. Frank? Aye. Kavanaugh? Aye. Motion passes 7 0. Mr. Mayor. Mr. Jones. With final consideration of passage of the ordinance. Second by Wethel. Motion by Jones and a second by Wethel. Trish, would you call the roll, please? Wethel? Aye. Roussel? Aye. Jones? Aye. Resnick? Aye. Barber? Aye. Frank? Aye. Kavanaugh? Aye. Motion passed 7-0. Public hearing Thanks, number Robert. two. Oh, mm -hmm. Sorry. Is Locust Street parking ramp repaired project public hearing? Mr. Mayor. Ms. Roussel? I move to receive and file and adopt the resolution. Second. second. Got a motion by Roussel and a second by Farber. Uh, Mike, am I coming to you? Thank you. Project Manager Steve Sampson Brown is recommending City Council approve the plan, specifications, form of contract, estimated cost of $250,000 for the Locust Street parking ramp repairs project. Repairs will address needed improvements to all three of the existing stairwells and their adjacent landing or lobby area. Specifically, the stairwells will be repainted to create a brighter interior walking space, degraded walking surfaces will be repaired, and stairwell doors and other parts of the entrances will either be refurbished or replaced. 
I concur with the recommendation and respect the request, Mayor and City Council approval. Thank you, Mike. We are in a public hearing to consider City Council approve the plan specifications form a contract and estimated cost of $250,000 for the Locust Street parking ramp repairs project. Do we have any public input on this item? Seeing none. Can't see very well anyway. But hearing none. <laughs> Still nobody on online there, so I'll bring it back to the table for any discussion. Mr. Mayor. Yeah, Mr. Resnick. Quickly, um, I know we have cameras in the parking facilities. Do we have them specifically in the stairwells? Ryan. Nucky is here, the transportation services director, and he'll respond to your question. And as long as you're in this general vicinity, we're cool with that. Yeah, like in the yeah I know. <laughs> uh, Ryan Nucky, director of transportation services. At the current time, we do not have cameras in the stairwells. Mm -hmm. We have mirrors in the stairwells for public safety, but we do not have cameras on the stairwells. I see. Uh, I know the security, the feeling of security is very important walking through a lot of stairwells myself. So uh, um, just something to consider, that, yeah. but this does not include cameras. Thank you very much. Mm -hmm. yeah. Yeah, Can I add on to that? Is it appropriate lighting in the, stair in the stairwells? Correct. Appropriate lighting will be done, and not only in the stairwells, but entering the stairwells also. Thank you. Any other questions or discussion on this one? Then I'll just add that I'm, I'm very thankful for everybody's work on this. I know that the Locust Street ramp has been a challenge. It's just a challenging structure, so I, I appreciate everybody in engineering. And then also the community feedback that was received to be able to get all this done and move it along. Served us well for a long time. Yeah. That's right. <laughs> all right, motion here is to receive and file and adopt the resolution. Uh, thank you, Ryan. Trish, would you call the roll, please? Wendell? Aye. Russell? Aye. Jones? Aye. Resnick? Aye. Barber? Aye. Frank? Aye. Kavanaugh? Aye. Motion passes 7-0. Public hearing number three is Jefferson Park retaining wall project. Mr. Mayor. Mr. Jones. Uh, we'll we file the documents and adopt the resolution. Second, second by Sprank. Um, got a motion by Jones. I think I, I'll go with Mr. Sprank for a second there. Mike, please. Thank you. Leisure Services Manager Marie Ware is recommending City Council approve the construction plans and specifications. An estimated base bid amount of $85,800, an estimated cost amount of plain faced wall of $220,700, or estimated cost amount of textured face wall of $233,200 for the Jefferson Park retaining wall replacement project. Hold the public hearing and adopt the attached resolution. I concur with the recommendation and respectfully request Mayor and City Council approval. Thank you, Mike. We are in a public hearing to consider the City Council approval construction plans and specifications, an estimated base bid amount of $85,800, and estimated cost amount of plain faced wall of $220,700, or estimated cost amount of textured faced wall of $233,200 for the Jefferson Park retaining wall replacement project. So, um, do we have anyone here for public input on this item? Seeing and hearing no one, uh, nothing online. Bring it back to the table then for any discussion. Mr. Mayor. Mr. Resnick. Uh, yes, I was wondering if we uh, ever considered this location to be uh, considered for a, a public art. Um, I know that there was public art on there uh, called graffiti, if, we, if it's not allowed, uh, or if it is perhaps a public art project, that uh, we could uh, maybe just uh, paint this as like gesso and get it ready for that. But has that been considered? Uh, this question. I'm sorry, are you referring to the wall itself? The wall, yeah, yeah, yeah. I mean, the part that we see. Uh, Marie Ware, Leisure Services Director for the city. Um, so we did talk about that because it has been an, uh, an art wall yes. um, the last number of years. And so depending upon which one of the faces, um, that could potentially be done. Or we also talked about there's the uh, fence that's up above, mm -hmm. and we'll be installing a fence on that isn't there. So there's one that's by the basketball courts, then there's one on the top, and then there'll be then one off also on the other side. And we talked about being able to actually put like a kind of a frame where it could be something that could change at times. Nice. So we've tried to look at ways that could be used in order to continue that um, uh, artful use of that um, park area. Would you could consider this a, a good base coat for that then? Uh, one of the surfaces could be that, uh, the other surface could not. So remember he said there was a, uh, the option, It's one of them's more texture. of a smoother, yes. one of them's more yes. of a texture, but it is about cost as well. Sure. So based upon 
how the bids come in, then we'll make that decision. So if it's the one that is not really paintable, um, then we would have this other option that we could do. Great. Well, thank you. Obviously, you've been putting a lot of time into it already. Thank mm -hmm. you. Thank you, Mr. Mayor. Any other questions or discussion? Okay. In that case, motion here is to receive and file and adopt the resolution. So, Trish, would you call the roll, please? Welcome. Aye. Rochelle? Aye. Jones? Aye. Resnick? Aye. Barber? Aye. Sprank? Aye. Kavanaugh? Aye. Motion passes 7-0. Next, we'll move on to public input. At this time, anyone participating in the meeting may address the City Council at, on the action item or on the agenda or on matters under the control of the City Council. For all in-person attendees, please approach the table and state your name and address when the Mayor asks if there's any in-person in input. For all remote attendees, please enter your name and address in the chat function and state your name and address over the phone when the Mayor asks if there is any virtual input. If more than one participant would like to speak, then City staff would determine the speaking order of the participants. Individual Remarks are limited to five minutes and the overall public input period is limited to 30 minutes. Under the Iowa, Medi Iowa Open Meetings Law, the City Council can take no formal action on comments given during public input or that do not relate to an action item on the agenda. Right, thank you, Trish. Welcome any public input this evening if you have any. And I, if, I would ask if you just come up here so we can make sure we catch your voice in the recording and obviously see you. We appreciate that. And I do apologize for the very weird strangeness of this whole situation. So name and address would. Amy Adolf, I live at 3029 Central Avenue in Dubuque. Okay, thank you. Um, on August 7th, 2023, a 16-year-old young man named Colin Campbell sat on the edge of the top of the seventh-story parking ramp on Fifth Street. That night he spoke with the emergency crisis response team, and after almost an hour, Colin made the decision and took his own life. He jumped off the edge of it seventh story parking ramp. Unfortunately, there was not an air cushion available and had there been, things might have ended differently. So I started a, a GoFundMe page and I'm trying to raise money to get an air cushion, a safety air cushion. Um, I had even had some information about that. Um, rescue and ready under four minutes um, is the time to pull it off the truck and get it ready. And if a good, <clears throat> if uh, an efficient and trained team um, is put together, it can be done under three. Um, I, I don't believe that we have one anywhere. I checked with the fire stations, and uh, nobody has said that they have. Um, and the cost is between ten and thirteen thousand dollars for one of them. So I guess, uh, and I spoke. I spoke with uh, the chief at the fire station briefly on the phone today. Um, and I plan on meeting back with her to see uh, you know, her input. <clears throat> but I think you know, for for future, um, to have that as a resource, not only in that type of situation. Um, but for fires or anything, I think that's, um, it's not a lot of money compared to a life. Um, and, and then I guess I was also wondering about, um, are there any things, you know, in place at, on the parking ramps to prevent people from climbing up or falling off the edge of the parking ramp? I'm sorry, what did you say your first name was? Cammie. Cammie. I'm sorry, Cammie, for forgetting that. Um, just so you know, even though this is really informal, we aren't allowed to respond to anything you're saying. Okay. So keep coming with your questions. If you have some more, ask them. We're writing them down. We're taking that information. And then also just taking the information that you're giving us as well. Okay. Um, I, I, just, I just didn't know if there were like, grants in place or if somebody could give me some direction on how to raise money to get the, you know, get one of those, um, some equipment, you know, for suicide awareness. and. And things like that, um, training. I just, they were up there for an hour with him, and I just feel like there's, um, that's a while. I, 
and not being able to talk somebody down. Um, it's just hard. So I, I sent my email. If anybody has any input, I do appreciate it. Okay. Thank you very much for being here and for your comments. Did you put your name and address? She couldn't hear you. Thank you for your comments. All right. Other public input this evening. Here. Good evening, Mayor, mm -hmm. City Council members. My name is. Oh yeah. yeah. Thank you. <laughs> We ready, okay. Trey? Okay. okay. Tara Dugan, 11082 English Mill Road. Um, I'm here this evening to give the council members some uh, some things I'd like you to consider later when you're looking at action item number two regarding the Dubuque Brewing and Malting Building. Um, the first thing that I would like you to consider is whether or not the city has required a performance bond from the contractor on a job like this, a demolition job that has significant hazards and significant hazardous materials, including asbestos. Secondly, on the demolition already performed by the contractor that's being considered for a new contract tonight, were all the standard asbestos protocols followed, including getting all required signatures from the abatement company? Did that demolition permit include a plan to protect our city's storm sewer system while this material is sitting on 30th Street. What precautions are currently in place to protect our city's stormwater system from asbestos contamination? When the material is removed from 30th Street, where will it go and will any of it be recycled? How is it that the city can use taxpayer money on a no-bid contract? If this falls under an emergency, which seems unlikely how long this project has drug on, why is it being awarded to a non-local contractor when there are local contractors who are experienced in this, have the capacity, and are already on a list pre-qualified to perform emergency services that, that exceed the city's crew's abilities? And is the city at all concerned that by awarding a contract that was not put out for a competitive bid, it could be jeopardizing its ability to be reimbursed in the future by the project's owner. Thank you. Okay. Thank you, Tara, for your comments. Any others? Any other public input? I'm seeing nobody else online yet. So I think we can move on to action items. Next on the agenda are action items. Action item number one is the Greater Dubuque Development Corporation quarterly update. Mr. Mayor. Mr. Resnick. I move to receive and file and listen to an abbreviated presentation. <laughs> Second by Sprague. <laughs> Second by Sprague. <laughs> Would you like us to pass this? Well, you heard the motion, Rick, so. That was a cheap shot. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, you have the floor to give and, the and presentation you, also, you would like to give. Rick. You also stole my line. Yeah. Uh, my name is Rick Dickinson. I reside at 205 Hill Street in Dubuque, Iowa. And I'm the president of Greater Dubuque Development Corporation. Uh, be, in order to prove there is a merciful God, I will not be making my presentation tonight, even though there's nothing better than a presentation during a soft, rolling thunder. <laughs> uh, what, what I'm handing out is our annual report. Um, my presentation tonight was to go over highlights of the Gen X survey that was that has been conducted by Greater Dubuque Development Corporation. I would ask for another opportunity to make that report to the council, although a PowerPoint is uh, is on the record and available to the citizens of Dubuque. Um, our annual meeting is this Wednesday at 5.30 at the Q Casino, the showroom. Uh, we will have our, our business meeting. Uh, Alex Dixon, our current uh, chair, will be making a presentation about the last year. Um, I'll give us a brief uh, update on activities of Greater Dubuque Development Corporation. And nominated to be our new chair is Kate Tagus, uh, and she will make a presentation at the end of the event. Um, the, I would urge you to take a look at the, uh, the annual report uh, this is the 40th anniversary of Greater Dubuque Development Corporation, founded in November of uh, 1984 when Dubuque hit rock bottom. 
and it includes information about the progress made. So until another date, uh, I'd, uh, I, I look forward to making a presentation uh, regarding the, uh, the, uh, the next gen survey. It has some pointed uh, findings in it, the, the thoughts and wishes of over 2,000 uh, folks in the, in the greater Dubuque region. Uh, I will also be presenting in the future a skills gap analysis that identifies what we need to focus on as workforce. I'll make that available to the Mayor Council, Citizens of Dubuque, and a, um, uh, an opportunity to Dubuque results for the last year, which are very optimistic. I'll be glad to answer any questions. I look forward to the next opportunity uh, in the daylight to uh, uh, provide information. <laughs> Thank you, Rick. We appreciate that. And um, I'll, I'll start by saying that I, I really uh, – Obviously, I always appreciate the work the Greater Dubuque Development Corporation is doing, but uh, the Gen X or the, the the next gen survey, I should say, is, is definitely an eye opener. And as a member of the board for the uh, for for the for GDBC, I would encourage everybody to take a look at it. I think it's really important for us as a council to see when we think about things like goal setting and what it means, and we talk about uh, bringing in a, a young workforce and uh, increasing our population and what that actually means in action. So I, I would encourage everybody to read it. Uh, with that, any other questions or discussion for Rick tonight? And we appreciate the request to um, come back another time, too. Okay. And I appreciate the direction from Council Member President. <laughs> 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 okay. The uh, motion here is to receive and file and hear the abbreviated presentation. Trish, would you call the roll, please? Mayor Kevin, I have uh, David Resnick. Uh, as the making the motion, I did not hear who seconded. Councilmember Sprank. Sprank, thank you. Mm -hmm. Okay. Uh, Wethel? Aye. Roussel? Aye. Jones? Aye. Resnick? Aye. Farber? Aye. Sprank? Aye. Kavanaugh? Aye. The motion passes 7 0. Action item number two is 3000 Jackson, Dubuque Foley and Multi Brewing <laughs> and Multi Building Update. Mr. Mayor. Mr. Sell. I move to receive and file and approve. Second by Sprank. Got a motion by Russell, second by Sprank. Mike, please. Um, Mr. Mayor, um, actually, there's a modified recommendation based on additional information we got today, so I'm not going to go through my recommendation because it's not germane anymore. Okay. I'll just ask uh, Alexis Steger to go ahead. Sure. So uh, we did hear from Zinzer today um, that they would be back on site uh, under Emerson's contract. So under the owner's contract, uh, mobilized a little bit today to get equipment back on site and anticipates being there tomorrow to continue the work that we had asked originally in the agenda to take down. So um, stabilizing the building that still remains at the back of the portion of 3000 Jackson. Um, that will be removed in increments until the engineer signs off that it is stable. Um, still with the intention of saving and salvaging some of that material. So that is the um, key element. And then they will clear 30th Street, put all of that onto the property and reestablish a fence so that it's around the uh, fence around the demolition area. So that is what uh, Zinzer will continue starting tomorrow under Emerson's contract, which is why the recommendation has changed. Um, we will not be imminently uh, contracting with Zinzer. However, we would like the um, ability to have some available should something not get finished, um, whether that be clearing a 30th Street, whether they get partially the building down. Um, it would still behoove the city to be able to act quickly with council's approval um, to spend and then assess should there still be an emergency uh, whenever Zinzer decides to leave that site. Um, we do not believe we need to do that today. Um, to address a couple of the, the questions um, from the public, just to make that a little easier, um, we would we would do a performance bond if the city had been the contracting uh, entity, but since we're not the contracting entity, we cannot require a performance bond on a contract that we're not party to. Um, so that would have been for Emerson only under the current contract. Um, they asked about if they um, worked on the asbestos protocols. Those were. Um, we are in contact with the DNR uh, several times as well just to make sure that those sign offs and that company that did the asbestos abatement um, followed all the protocols and we got the sign off and all of the official documents and the DNR also signed off on that. So we did make sure that all the asbestos was handled as required. 
Um, and then um, including a plan to protect the storm sewer system. Um, this is protected just as other sites where you, uh, you know, protect the storm sewer itself so that materials that are raw can't come into that sewer. You will still have runoff water that comes from that area um, because it only stops solid particles. That runoff water is the same as anything that comes off of any land. Um, that now that all the asbestos and other things are removed, it would be similar to other sites. Um, the materials, when they're removed from 30th, uh, from the, the site, where will they go? Um, and will any be recycled? Currently, yes, the owner has uh, told us that he would like to recycle as much material as possible. He'd like to resalvage. The others um, can become landfill and other such things since they did the asbestos abatement. So um, that can actually be utilized at other sites for landfill. And then um, the no-bid contract does fall under emergency. Um, I didn't know if there was anything more that Krona might want to say about that. The state allows for emergency procurement as well as our policies and procedures. Um, that emergency procurement requires that an engineer is also saying it's an emergency, which we have been presented to council um, from WHKS a couple different times. We did an intermediate report after the initial um, deconstruction so that you know that currently it's still an imminent threat to the public safety. Um, and then the, the only piece I would add is that the that there are multiple different procedures both in the state code and the city code um, that allow for the action that was taken. Um, 364.12 of the Iowa code allows for notice to be given and um, you have to serve it a particular way when that time has come and gone and if there's been non-compliance, a municipality is authorized to perform the work and assess the cost of the property. We then also incorporate that into our local ordinance as well. And those were part of the packet, the service of those notices uh, several different times. The first notice is the, the underlying notice, but uh, there were updates and other things that needed to be served as we've uh, changed timelines or things have happened on the site. So those were all included in the packet as well. Um, to meet that state code. And then um, the last question from public input was, is the city concerned that by avoiding a contract um, not put out for competitive bid that did jeopardize the ability to reimburse uh, reimbursement by the, by the uh, assessment? And I don't believe that there's anything in the code that would prevent us from that as a non-bid contract. No. Okay. It specifically authorizes assessment against the property by following that process. I believe that's all we have for an update. Okay. All right. So just, I need some clarity, I think, Alexis. So you're saying that um, as far as approving what was on the agenda this evening, we don't, we no longer need to do that at this time. Correct. Correct. We no longer need the contract. Um, it's possible that we may need funds depending on where it stops. So if they were to stop this week, we would need something to allocate to maybe the 30th street opening or, you know, things like that. Mm -hmm. um, that is something that I believe the city manager could address if we could come back to council in an emergency meeting or if we want to authorize the funds to be held until the end of this $75,000 portion of the project. Gotcha. Thank you. Go ahead, Mike. So hopefully the contractor is going to alleviate the emergency component of the situation. And there's two components really here. There's emergency and there's inconvenience. So if the contractor that's working for the developer, the owner, alleviates the emergency side of this, then it just becomes inconvenience and our process would be different. But if the contractor stops again, while there's still a hazardous situation, then we would like the ability to step in and alleviate the emergency situation. So uh, uh, further, for more clarity, what, what do you need from us to be able to do that if we, as a council, were to take action on something tonight? See, Trent, I don't think we need anything from the council tonight. I'm just really describing what what action I'll take. If it's an emergency situation, we're going to step in and, and alleviate the emergency. If it's just an inconvenience because the street's closed, we're not going to do that. Okay. We're going to go through a process that we normally would go through to clear up whatever needs to be cleared up. So should my motion be changed then to just say receive and file? I think so. Yes. Yes. I would make that. I would make that motion. So you you like to amend your I would previous amend motion? I my motion to, to say receive and file. Okay. 
And the I'll second there was spring. Yeah, I'll second that. Okay. <clears throat> All right. Is that is that what we needed, Krenna? Okay, sorry, I'm putting. Yeah, I know. It's like <laughs> right shoulder, behind yeah. me. <laughs> um, okay. So, are we all clear on the motion on the table then? Yeah. So, any further discussion? Or Mr. Mayor, yeah, Mr. Reds. I noticed that the uh, the last uh, municipal infraction was July 9th. Do we continue with those, or are, are, do they continue, and how long will they continue? Yes, they have continued actually since then, um, but they will continue until the contractor is fully on site working. So if they start the work tomorrow, it will not be cited tomorrow. Is this a point of negotiation or are these hard and fast? Right now, um, the citations are, but they go to pretrial and we can offer uh, other opportunities at that pretrial conference. And that would be August 7th for those that have currently been written. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Mayor. Mm -hmm. I just... I think I want a little clarity, if I may. So the um, the situation that has changed since our initial um, what has been put out for us to read in advance. So they Zinzer has now received a check. <coughs> that is correct. They are going to move forward with the original work that was hired out by Mr. Emerson. Correct. We are not hiring Zinzer. Correct. Um, if this was not the situation. Um, one thing based on public input that I do want to ask for a full understanding is we have been dealing with this for some time. I do not disagree that it is an urgent situation for the health and safety of our community, but it has been. And so when we talk about having fair bids placed, I just want to fully understand when we talk about months of an urgent situation of safety, uh, why is the urgency so quick now that we don't go through that process? Sure. So I'll address a little bit of it, but I'm going to turn some of that over to Krenna. Thank you. Um, so the part that I can address is that the uh, demolition permit is pulled by one contractor. That contractor is then uh, responsible for everything that goes along with that demolition and the scope of that demolition. The liability um, right now resides with Zinzer. They control the site. So although the owner owns the site, the contractor controls the site. So we are under uh, a little bit of that problem and that the liability still lies with somebody that would need to sign off if we handed it off. And so that starts to get to be a little bit of a legal issue, which is where I'll turn it over to Krenna <laughs> to deal with that. I'm thinking. Um, what Alexis stated is is right. That there, it would be difficult to transition um, liability to someone new at that point. Um, the other bit is um, continuity, but also familiarity with the site and the work done. Um, I suspect that there would be um, issues in coverage should there be any issue. So for example, um, if, a, if there was a further collapse somewhere, and you had brought in a new contractor determining if there had been error by contractor one or contractor two, it, it becomes a difficult, um, it's a conundrum really for, for legal purposes and trying to figure out who is responsible for that. Um, I, I think it, from an insurance standpoint too, it, it also creates um, issues. Um, when someone is familiar with the site, it, it would not be unusual to say, keep going. It's just that instead of being under the um, initial contract uh, with the property owner, um, the municipality or the governmental entity stepping in, because this process uh, is for uh, public bodies, governmental agencies, um, could do its own piece of it in order to abate or to remedy the situations as has been under the state code. So when, when you look at um, the state code, what we as the city have the ability to do is to abate 
to require abatement of a nuisance, public or private, in any reasonable manner. We can require the removal, repair, dismantling of a dangerous building or structure. Um, then there are some additional sections as well in there. Um, but if a property owner doesn't perform that within a reasonable period of time after notice, we can perform it and assess the cost in the same manner as a property tax. So that's what's spelled out in the code. Um, and then, of course, there's emergency provisions as well. In the emergency provisions, it's actually done differently, where you actually perform the work first and then give someone an opportunity to be heard after you have performed the work. So at this point in time, what they have done is they've handled it as a traditional nuisance. So they were given notice, opportunity to repair, de demolish, secure, stabilize, etc. That has expired, and so then as you work your way further down in the code, that's what allows us to intervene at this point, should we have needed to, and to have the work done and assessed. Um, I'm trying to think here, what, what didn't I cover? Um, in the, the, so the one other thing is in the code for emergency repair, there's a requirement that there's a reasonability. So the estimate needs to go through a process of reasonability. Um, that process is comparing the estimate to things that we do that are similar or in comparison in our recent. So um, we had recent demolition of 2527 Washington um, and several others. So we compare those costs um, to make sure that the cost estimate that we receive is reasonable. Um, so that's the one provision that sits under the emergency as well as the reasonability check for estimate. You use the word conundrum, and I think that that has been the situation since I've been on council related to this property. So the conundrum situation is not new for sure. Um, a question regarding then, say the emergency work is performed, it is paid for by Emerson, and then it is no longer an emergency but work stops. Then, would we find Mr. Emerson, I guess at that point it's not an emergency, but if work stops completely, would we find him while we are getting bids for additional work to be done? And that process would estimate to be how long that we would put it out for bid? So we likely wouldn't put it out for bid until after district court. So we would fine in a different manner. Today we are fining as a municipal infraction for 750 and then a thousand subsequent. Um, in the future, it's a much bigger project. So as soon as the emergency is done, we're now at the 700 to million dollar cost estimate to clear the site. That elevates that municipal infraction to the district court for the abatement and we would ask for abatement in that citation so we would not start anything until the court said yes we agree there's been a default you can abate and then we would go yes and we would no longer be following emergency provisions because there is no public threat to those around the building um, and should be secured by a fence to also help alleviate the site security issue could we start the process of bids while we are going through the legal process of that? I believe you can, however, it wouldn't be, I mean, it would put a lot of staff work into something that they may not say yes to. They don't have to agree to what we recommend under the citation. So the court could say, yes, they're in default, but it's a fine, you can't go bait yet. So yes, we could, at that point we'd wanna discuss it I think at that point yeah but we also never know how long the court's going to take right, whether sure. they're going to give continuances mm -hmm. and, and bids aren't good forever so it, we probably would not bid it until we knew that we could do something about it thank you so what the, um, yeah go ahead thank you Mr. Yeah. Um, <clears throat> so he's supposed to get the street cleaned up and pick up what le is what's left there is that correct mm -hmm. essentially or is he gonna or is it okay for us to just like push it all away from the street and that's and put a fence around it and that's it stabilize as well so the stabilization that's left in the whks engineers report that there's still a back structure yes, yes. that has to be stabilized there's a lot of unstable areas including the interior wall that's facing the, the site mm -hmm. but also the the wall that faces 30th street that brick is not stable or connected and that has to come down in a safe manner then they will clear 
30th Street to put everything onto the private property. So there will be nothing left within the right of way or the side of the right of way, and they'll reestablish the fence within the property line. So, okay. So he's going to push everything onto his property, off the street, hopefully knock down that building, knock on wood, because I don't think he's going to. I think he's just going to push everything in, off Central, put up a fence, and say, well, it's this, or, <laughs> Jack, or 30th Street's open. And we're going to be finding him and doing this all over again. But that's just how I feel. The way he's acted, the way he's not been honest with us, the way he's kind of, as I've been saying, yanking our chain. Uh, he's, so I just, yeah, I, I hope he does what he says he's going to do, but I don't think he's going um, to. But I can get where public was asking about uh, asbestos, because if all the stuff's going to sit there, that water is going to go somewhere, and it's going to go into our city sewers, even though it, it doesn't have asbestos anymore. But now you've got brick debris and such going into the city sewers. So hopefully he cleans up his mess. And that stabilization would still be emergency work. So even okay. if he clears everything off 30th and puts up a fence, that stabilization would still be a risk. We wouldn't be able to open 30th Street even if clear. Okay. Okay. Thank you. Any other questions or discussion at this point? Okay. And I thank you for answering the questions, at least a number of them that were brought up tonight, um, and appreciate the thought on that's being put into this to potentially be able to move forward if we need to, and Mr. Emerson doesn't do what he needs to. Okay. Motion here is to receive and file um, as the amended motion. So, Trish, would you call the roll, please? Lethel? Aye. Roussel? Aye. Jones? Aye. Resnick? Aye. Barber? Aye. Sprank? Aye. Kavanaugh? Aye. Motion passes 7-0. Action item number three, <coughs> excuse me, is work session request uh, imagine the view update. That's correct, Ms. Jones. We'll receive and file the documents and uh, set the work session for Monday, August 19th at 5 30 p.m. Second. A motion by Jones and a second by Roussel. Trish, would you call the roll, please? Wevel? Aye. Roussel? Aye. Jones? Aye. Resnick? Aye. Barber? Aye. Sprank? Aye. Kavanaugh? Aye. Motion passes 7 0. We'll now move into council member reports. Okay. Well, I know this is a weird meeting, and we are sitting here in the dark with not many people. I do appreciate the members of the public who were able to join us tonight. Um, I'm going to begin council member reports by um, I've, I've prepared a, a statement that I worked on. Um, you know, in a moment like we're facing right now, it's kind of hard to figure out what words to choose as you prepare to say something about um, events that are incredibly important um, to our history as Americans. And I just, um, I put this together, I, I, I would uh, I would hope to, to be offered the grace that um, one can be offered in moments where it's uh, challenging to find the words sometimes. So I appreciate your, uh, I appreciate your patience with me. There are moments in American history when we as citizens have an obligation to pause, reflect, and choose a path ahead that best serves our democratic republic. This weekend, we've experienced one of those moments with the attempted assassination of former President Donald Trump. Let me first say that I, along with my colleagues of the city, Dubuque City Council, wish President Trump a speedy recovery, recovery, and we are keeping him and his family in our thoughts and prayers. I also want to recognize and thank the many elected and appointed public servants in our country, from President Biden to former President Trump himself, and on to our local representatives at the local, state, and national levels who have made genuine and heartfelt calls for civility, calm, and unity in the weeks and months ahead. I implore all of our elected and appointed leaders to keep this focus at this challenging and pivotal time. Tonight, I want to take these calls for unity and civility one step further and speak directly to the people of Dubuque, Iowa. It's easy to look at moments like this and quickly become paralyzed by the gravity and the difficulty of the situation. It's understandable that one's reaction may be, what can I do? I'm just one person living here in this city on the Mississippi. Thankfully, this is one of those moments where our actions matter. What we all choose to do next, right here where we live, will shape the future of our country. We're all on the same team. We're all human beings. We're all Americans. We are Iowans. And we are Dubuquers. 
We have a direct impact on the success of our community and our country through the way that we treat each other, how we speak to each other, how we write to each other, how we write about each other on social media, how we listen, how we interact, how we show civility and respect. We control each and every one of these things. We will disagree, and that is healthy for democracy. We must argue about ideas and learn from one another. But when arguing and disagreement reach the point of incivility, when we are no longer listening to one another or respecting one another, and when we have resorted to violence, we have gone too far. The solution to this national problem begins right here, where we live together. When we live in a city of just under 60,000 people, we have a unique opportunity to get to know each other, to interact with our neighbors and our fellow Dubuqueers every day, and solve our challenging problems together. As a country, we have lost our way. As people living in Dubuque and places like it, we have the solution. I encourage all of us to recommit ourselves to unity. We have what it takes to be respectful, have an open mind, and truly listen to each other. We can find common ground and work together. We do these things every day in other parts of our life, and we can recommit to doing them more, and we must demand that our leaders do the same. That includes the members of this city council sitting right here, and the city of Dubuque workers that serve this city every day. So on behalf of my colleagues tonight, we recommit to you that we will continue to serve this community with respect, civility, openness, transparency, and kindness in the spirit of true public service. I know that each of us in this community has what it takes to find the right path forward for our city, for our state, and for our country. So thank you to everyone for doing your part to once again make us a truly United States of America. Thank you. And offer a moment for any other city council members to provide council member reports. On a happier note, Mr. Mayor. <laughs> sure. Last uh, Thursday evening, I was I represented you and was able to address the folks present at the grand opening of the Q Casino. And what a fabulous job they've done at that. Um, looking at it, it's hard to imagine that Jane's seen nothing yet, but that's kind of the fact on Schmidt Island right now. Um, the, the comment that got some applause was I uh, talked about uh, citizens in 1984 going to the polls to, on a referendum to to publicly finance an $8 billion dog track and then cross their fingers that it all worked out. I said, spoiler alert, it did. <laughs> it worked out better. So uh, it was a great evening, and uh, you ain't seen nothing yet. Yeah. Perfect example of how we get stuff done. Mr. Mayor. Yeah. Fine. So on a technology front, on behalf of the city of Dubuque, I continue to participate in the FCC commission uh, committee uh, regarding uh, this wonderful report that hopefully will be forthcoming within a year or so. Uh, and I am the recorder for the subgroup, and we are working on the text for the document as we speak. And um, this is a monthly commitment, uh, so stay tuned for more as to what we can share with the public. Uh, but on another note, I'm actually going to be a guest at Google's headquarters next week, uh, with along with the AI committee from the National League of Cities, where we are working on the AI playbook for the National League of Cities municipalities. So that's another document that hopefully will be forthcoming and to be shared. So cool. Yeah. So I'll have more to talk about at the next meeting regarding that. Thanks for serving that capacity, Mr. Yeah. Okay. Well, I had a, a really unique event to go to. Um, the Habitat for Humanity group had a brought in sheep on the go to clear the land at their new um, pocket neighborhood up on, off of Hill Street. And so they had an ice cream truck there and they have this cute little pack of sheep that are without lawnmowers, without chemicals, clearing the land for the new uh, pocket neighborhood. And what was also neat was that residents from the, the nearby Mount Pleasant home were coming out to see where their new neighbors were going to live and they're really looking forward to um, having new neighbors and, and building a partnership there. So that was a great fun event. 
Thanks, Mr. Shaw. Mr. Mayor? Yeah, Mr. Resnick. Uh, last Thursday, I was at a Tri-State Wind Symphony concert, and the final number of the night uh, was, uh, it was called Freedom Road, and it can, uh, we had a guest narrator, is Robert Kimball from the Dubuque Dream Center. And during this uh, piece, he uh, narrated uh, 10 quotes from Dr. Martin Luther King Jr. And uh, many of those same quotes uh, were uh, very much of what you espoused with your readings tonight. And the audience was uh, very captivated by that. I think that what you have said tonight and what Martin Luther King Jr. has said uh, has, has broad acceptance in the American public. And uh, I appreciate your words tonight. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Resnick. Yeah, you're welcome. Um, thank you for saying what I think we are as a group probably feeling, I must say for myself. You spoke to what my heart feels. Um, I, I, of course, all of us, I think, have thought a lot about what's going on in our country right now. and. Um, in my faith community, we pay, pray for elected officials routinely. And so this, you know, yesterday we did that in a, a very unique way that I had not done before. Um, for the healing of former President Trump, for the healing of the family of the man who lost his life, for the healing of people that witness gun violence. Um, it's an incredibly impactful event for them, but for all of us. Uh, it made me think about the first day that I was sworn into office and I was um, taught the security protocol. And I have to say it was a really sobering moment when somebody said I was going to learn about a security protocol. Um, not everyone at home knows that we have Dubuque PD here to keep not just elected officials and staff safe, but also all of our constituents and our residents safe so that they feel free to come and say what they want to say and feel free and safe to do so. And so I think honoring law enforcement for their overwhelming commitment to us, to our community, Dubuque PD does an exceptional job of always making me feel um, that I have uh, the comfort to say what I need to say and what I want to say. And that's important right now um, as we do it respectfully. Uh, I heard a commentator say this, and I think it's a great way when we think about unity and how each of us individually can proactively this week work toward unity. Um, and I'm sorry, I can't remember the commentator, but they said, all of us know someone who looks different than us, loves different from us, votes different from us, and this week we should call them or we should talk to them. We should this week make an effort, each one of us, to reach out to one person like that. And as we do that, I think that's a healing process that each individual can do. And um, yeah, I felt like maybe that's an action we could make a weekly journey of um, here in our country and here in our, our community. Thank you. Thank you, Rebecca. Well, yeah, Mr. Jones. Um, I haven't heard much about this locally, but as I was walking across uh, Washington Park coming here, there's a time capsule buried just across from our front door um, that was buried in 1976 in celebration of the 200th year of America. And coming up in 2026 is the 250th anniversary, which is the semi-quincentennial of the United States. And I haven't heard of any local groups that were planning anything, but uh, people ought to start thinking about that. Um, we're fragile as evidenced by, by all the goings on in, in the last uh, decades. And we, we, to, to continue the comments so far, you know, we've driven each other, driven ourselves apart from each other, and it's time to start driving back together. And this could be one of the things that helps us to, to cement our, our unity and to understand our, our common ground, which is substantial, and find our way forward. So I just want to plant that seed so you're all thinking about that. That was a pretty big deal. Let's not paint the hydrants. <laughs> um, <laughs> colors, but, uh, yeah, thank you. But thank you, Mr. Mayor. Well, there's no better way to find unity than locking yourselves in the basement and then sitting in the dark for a couple hours while you have a meeting that's supposed to be in the light. So thanks a lot, everybody, for being here. We have a little bit more work to do as a council. We have a closed session, so I will entertain a motion, please.
Mayor. Yeah. No. City Council on a full session of the court. So chapter 21.5 of the court file to discuss purchase or sale of real estate. Second. Motion by Jones and a second by Roussel. For the record, the attorney the city council will consult with on the matters to be discussed in closed session is city attorney Crenna Brumwell. Trish, would you call the roll, please? Wessel? Aye. Roussel? Aye. Jones? Aye. Resnick? Aye. Barber? Aye. Sprank? Aye. Kavanaugh? Aye. Motion passes 7-0. We will be in closed session.